In the year 55 BC, spectacular news reached the Senate in Rome. For the first time, Roman soldiers had crossed the ocean from Gaul, sailed beyond the known world. Two legions dropped anchor off the coastline of Kent on the legendary island of Britain. The British Celtic tribesmen defended themselves vigorously, but ultimately bowed to the highly organized Roman legionaries. They were commanded by the man whose name is synonymous with some of the more enlightened achievements of the great Roman Empire, Gaius Julius Caesar. We have some very interesting information about him that survives from antiquity, biographies. We have his own writing, which conveys a certain force of personality. But there's also the fact that he was, in fact, an extremely important figure in foreshadowing the Roman Empire. Uh, he was a great man. He was a man of great achievement, a great general. He overturned the whole of a Roman state. He very nearly succeeded, and yet at the height of his triumph, he was overthrown. He got it wrong at the end, and he got it wrong very tragically. It's a wonderful story. Towering above all others, his brilliant military career was encapsulated in three famous words, Vene, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. His life inspires not only history, but also literature and drama, with Shakespeare moved to write about this complex character. In Rome, where family background and descendancy was of fundamental importance, Caesar fortunately had all the right credentials. A military genius and an intellectual giant. And I think if you actually look at portrait bust of Caesar, something of the character of the man comes over. It's a very thin, sort of sensitive face, uh, very fine features. He looks more like a, a university professor, perhaps, than, than a general. And then he's rather sort of fine hair, rather than very thin on top. And he was clearly very sensitive about this. I think it may have been perhaps a genetic thing. The name Caesar comes from a Latin word, Caesarius, which means hairy. And I think it was a name that ran in the family, probably because um, genetically his family used to go bald rather early on. Anyway, after he became dictator, one of the honours that um, the, the subservient senate voted him was that he would wear a laurel wreath whenever he wanted to. And this was something that Caesar actually wore because he was so sensitive about the bald patch on top of his head. He was a member of a great patrician family. The Julii uh, claimed descent from the goddess Venus and from Aeneas, who, according to legend, came from Troy to found the Latins in Italy. He was thus a member of a dominating elite who uh, were for the most part those who got elected to magistracies and were the most important people in the Senate. From the age of 10 onwards, he would actually have gone about the Roman Forum uh, following, shadowing great men of the time uh, in their various political and legal duties. So he would see at first hand how a man of his class had to behave. Caesar's education and training was to arm him with an outstanding oratory style, which would take him to the very summit of imperial glory. The career that was to bring him so much fame began quite humbly. Caesar was a minor civil servant. He began his road to destiny with a succession of administrative posts in Asia Minor. It's one of the things about the Roman system is that the moves are all mapped out in advance. There's a thing called the cursus honorum, which is a list of the offices that you go through in order. And in fact, he has a pretty orthodox career, starting with military service, then getting your lowest magistracy, which gives you membership of the Senate, uh, and gradually working your way up these offices. This fledgling career began shaking. During a short sea journey, he was captured by pirates. In normal circumstances after capture, a short life of hell below the foul decks of a pirate craft would be all one could hope for. Not so Caesar. I think one of the extraordinary things about Caesar is a story which his biographer Plutarch says about the beginning of his um, public life, really, when he was driven into virtual exile from Rome. And he was traveling from Italy to the eastern Mediterranean the Aegean here, and he was captured by pirates. Uh, he was captured by the pirates, and he never said 
that he would do anything other than get them punished when he was finished. And they thought this was a wonderful piece of youthful bravado. And um, uh, they were going to ransom him. And Caesar, only a young man of 20 or whatever he was, was supremely confident. And they said, we're going to ransom you for so much money. And he said, no, oh, that's ridiculous. And I'm worth far more than that, far more than that. And they thought, you know, going to write one here. And they said, OK, OK. And then Caesar said, but you know, I'm going to come back and hang you all from the yard arm. Ha, 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 ha. So they all had a good laugh about that. And, you know, he's a right one, isn't he? But of course, sure enough, that is precisely what Caesar did. But he wasn't entirely ruthless. One of his biographers says that though he had them crucified, which is the appropriate punishment for piracy, he had their throats cut first so they didn't suffer because by that time he actually knew them as people. But you have to remember that piracy was a very great scourge of the Mediterranean world at that time. And lots of people were taken hostage and some of them sold on the slave market. So I'm afraid his attitude toward them was absolutely typical, I think, and in a way justified. Not surprisingly, the ambitious and decisive young man did not go unnoticed. In 65 BC, Caesar was elected to the post of Adil, responsible for public games and entertainments. This was something of a coup, giving him the chance to win votes and favor with the plebeians by spending money on feasts, gladiators, and chariot races. Other people's money, of course. Another way of becoming popular was to exploit magistracies, which actually required you to provide benefits for the Roman people. One of these was the aedileship, an office which involved administering the city of Rome, and in particular, holding the games which were the chief form of entertainment for the people of Rome. And Caesar took his chance and laid on these games in a very lavish and spectacular fashion, so creating himself a high profile among the people of Rome. By 61 BC, Caesar's career was blossoming. He was made governor of further Spain. But a new Julius Caesar was about to emerge. The politician was about to give way to the soldier. It would mark the next 30 years of his life. In that year, Pompey the Great was newly returned to Rome, a conquering hero of her ever-expanding empire. He returned with vast wealth, bathed in glory. How the ambitious Caesar must have envied his fame. Diplomatically, with the skill of a politician, he wholeheartedly joined in with the celebrations. He needed the cover. During his absence, Caesar had been having an affair with Pompey's wife, Muccia. Before things could come out in the open, he shrewdly left Rome to take up his governorship in Spain, as far as possible from the man who would become his greatest enemy. Julius Caesar, the legend, was gradually being formed. Caesar's first overseas military command was in Spain, and we know that he fought a number of battles and um, wasn't quite responsible for finishing off the um, Spanish resistance, but was um, largely instrumental in bringing it into the Roman fold. In those far-off days, the job of administrator went hand-in-hand hand with military command. Rome's provincial governors covered the legions stationed in his province. Caesar proved himself a first-rate administrator and a formidable soldier and commander. He ate the same food as his men, slept in the open with them, and marched alongside his legionnaires who hailed him as Imperator, Victorious General. In an age when a general benefited directly from the spoils of war, he became incredibly wealthy. From so much hard fighting, he also became an incredibly experienced and able general. But he still had his political ambition. That meant that he had to return to Rome, where Caesar wished to become a candidate for the post of consul. Now that the heat surrounding his dalliance with Pompey's wife had cooled, he could return to the city. Caesar used his time in Rome to gain for himself the governorship of Cisalpine Gaul, Illyricum and Transalpine Gaul. It was here he faced his first major pitched battle. 
it would certainly not be his last. All members of the elite can command an army. It's assumed that you can, and they all do military service. Even Cicero can do it. But of course, no one knew that he would be anything very exceptional, I think, until he got the big Gallic command. And of course, he has in mind rivaling Pompey, who by this time has set new standards for what it's possible to achieve uh, in command with the kind of resources they now have. He was not to return to Rome for nine years. In all that time, he was occupied with what became known as the Gallic Wars. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The Helvetii were a Celtic tribe, then living in what we know today as Switzerland. Under constant threats from the Germans, they decided to emigrate en masse and settle in the west of Gaul. This was disturbing news for the Romans. It was the Helvetii that were on the move and were felt as a threat to the Roman province. Something needed to be done to, to get in the way of this great troop movement a great movement of peoples, and that's what Caesar set off to do. Marching 30 miles each day, Caesar and his troops arrived in Geneva in just eight days. He was in time to block the route of the approaching Helvetii. I think the amazing thing about the conquest of Gaul, or the initial conquest of Gaul, was that it was so fast, it was so quick, and it was so efficient. Caesar was famed for the speed of movement, um, celeritas, just means swiftness. And, you know, he'd have forced marches, he'd turn up where he wasn't expected and so on. And he would endear all those hardships himself. And this is one reason why his troops were prepared to follow him. He, he actually led from the front. So within two or three years, um, all Gaul was conquered. It was just absolutely amazing, unbelievable. Not for the last time, Caesar's reputation as a ruthless defender of Roman interests was secured. He may have fathered Rome's interest, but Caesar always had one eye on acquiring glory and fame that might equal that of Pompey. So Caesar really wanted an excuse, I think, to keep his army in being. There was also the question, perhaps, of getting even more loot, because loot was what he was after, in the form of cattle, perhaps, gold, maybe, if there was gold to be had, and slaves. So I think for that reason, he turned his eyes to Britain. He claimed that um, the security of Gaul um, really was threatened by tribes people in Britain who crossed over, crossed the channel, perhaps as mercenaries fighting with the Gauls against the Romans. Soon he was on the march again. This time to deal with the Germans led by the fearsome Ariovistus. The Germans were warlike and ferocious, feared even by the mighty Roman army. As they neared German territory and stories of German notoriety grew, terror swept through the Roman army. But Caesar's powers of persuasion once more stood him in good stead. He turned the tide of fear into a flood of Roman pride. Caesar then took the fight to the Germans. They met the terrifying men under Ariovistus in pitched battle. Although Caesar's men slaughtered the German left wing, the Roman left flank was soon in dire trouble. Following the defeat of the Germans, fear of the seemingly indestructible Roman army spread like wildfire. In the north, the Belgi people beyond the Seine in what is now northeast France and Belgium, were certain that they would be next to receive Caesar's unwelcome attention. The forces were amassed to deal with the threat. For Caesar, here at last was a chance to trump even Pompey's great victories. The quality of Caesar's generalship is much argued about. One can't have a, argue with success, and even the defeats of so many 
comparatively ill-organized tribesmen was a tremendous military achievement. One feature of this was Caesar's relationship with his troops. It was helped by the fact that he doubled their pay. But he was also a commander who led from the front and who tried to enlist the sympathy of his troops for himself and show his own sympathy for them. By conquering the vast territory of North Gaul, he would expand the empire further than his rival ever had done. Caesar, of course, succeeded. But not strictly by official means. He increased the size of his army to twice the number authorized by the Senate, and again acted swiftly and decisively. He surprised the Belgi north of the River Ain, dispersing them to all four corners of the earth. Fifteen days of thanksgiving were declared in Rome to celebrate Caesar and his victories. Caesar was aware that Pompey had had an enormous head start. He's only six years older. But by the time Caesar is about to start his military service, Pompey has already been defeating all Sulla's enemies all around the Mediterranean. Pompey was allowed to hold the consulship with no previous office and several years before the legal age. Caesar's career is much more orthodox in that respect, much slower. Pompey, I think, reckoned to be tops, to be ahead of all his contemporaries. And as Caesar himself says, Pompey couldn't bear the idea of having an equal. So I think it was always going to be a bit difficult because Caesar, of course, also had tremendous aspirations. If Pompey was jealous and worried about this new and dangerous Caesar, he was not alone. Many people in Rome shared his disquiet, quite rightly, as it later proved. I think the secret of his success as a commander is first of all his relations with the soldiers. He's a very charismatic figure. They are prepared to die for him. He knows how to talk to them. He gives them the feeling that he's taking risks with them, that he's generous to them when they're finished with the campaign and they can go and have a good time and plunder whatever they like, but that there must be absolute discipline during the campaign. He was fantastically ruthless. The number of Gauls killed, the bloodshed in Gaul, was stupendous, but it was remarkable. This was a tremendous acquisition to the Roman Empire. Uh, vast numbers of square miles that were added in an extraordinarily short time. And in terms of the status which Caesar would normally have expected to get from that, he would have expected to, this to raise him to an extraordinary position of authority and respect within the Roman state. The work among the Germans was clearly the legacy of an ambitious man. Impressive as these military triumphs had been, Caesar was planning an even more daring adventure. No mere river now stood between him and his goal. Now, it was an ocean. The legendary island of Britain, if it existed, lay beyond the known world. A land that many believed to be a figment of a vivid imagination. Assembling a fleet of some 80 ships to carry the two legions he took with him, he set sail from Portus Itius bound for Britain. It was the year 55 BC. Britain is such a long way away. They start from an assumption of the Mediterranean as a center of things. And then you've got the world and you've got ocean, ocean stream going around it all. And then the thing about Britain is it's beyond ocean. It's the other side of the bounds of the civilized world. It's like space travel. You're going that far away. You're conquering nature in the service of Rome. This, again, was something very special for a Roman general to achieve. Terrified by the prospect of this mysterious land, the Romans would not at first leave their ships. Even Caesar's powers of persuasion seemed to have become exhausted. So Caesar used the catapults, the ballistae, set up a barrage 
and uh, they managed to keep the, um, the Britons back a little bit from the, fr from the shore, uh, but the boats couldn't really, the ships couldn't really come in. So the Romans had to jump down into um, deep water and wade ashore with these um, fearful <laughs> savages confronting them. And they were very, very reluctant to do it indeed. And perhaps they wouldn't have done it, but um, there was the standard bearer, the eagle bearer of the 10th legion, which was Caesar's favorite legion. And the, the standard bearer of the 10th legion said, well, lads, you know, if you want to lose the eagle, it's up to you, but I'm going ashore. That's what the boss says. So he jumped down and waded ashore. And of course, the others, he broke that um, psychological barrier. And the rest of the soldiers jumped down to and fought, waded ashore and followed him. The native Britons, however, were not going to allow themselves to be so easily beaten. Eighteen ships were approaching Britain, filled with cavalry. As they neared the coast, a violent storm hit them, dispersing the ships in all directions. Seizing their chance, the Britons rallied and attacked. The Seventh Legion had been out foraging for food when the Britons struck at them from the woods. They were caught in a desperate situation. There was total confusion as the British war chariots and cavalry swarmed in, pinning down the helpless legionaries. Chariots were the greatest problem for the Romans in the guerrilla-type warfare waged by the Britons. They could descend quickly on the slow-moving columns of legionaries and wreak havoc. There were the Britons, and they were in chariots, which is something that um, in the good old days of Homer, way back in the sort of Greek Bronze Age, people had used chariots. And the Romans had encountered Celtic chariots um, way back in the days of the old days of the Republic, but um, no living Roman had ever encountered people in chariots. They'd certainly stopped using them in Gaul. And here were these blue-painted Britons using chariots. In the event, Caesar, who now possessed some 30 horse, was able to place his legions in battle formation. The Britons were overwhelmed, and fled into the woods. The first Roman incursion to Britain was a short one, and 18 days after he had landed, Caesar returned to Gaul for the winter. But he would be back. Unfortunately for the Britons, Caesar's appetite for the conquest had been whetted. The following year, on July the 6th, 54 BC, he set sail for a second time. This time, he took 800 ships carrying five legions and 2,000 horsemen with him and was not prepared to leave until he had conquered all. Once again, he planned to land on the coastline of Kent at around dawn, but strong tides carried his ships off course. The Romans landed at noon, and Caesar marched the army 12 miles inland as far as the River Stour. There, the Britons, led by Cassivellaunus, chief of the Catavellunae, tried to halt the Roman progress. Britain at this time was completely different to the Roman world in terms of social and political structure. Roman power was centralized and highly organized, whereas the Britons were grouped together into separate clans. Each of these Celtic tribes were led by their own king. In the past, there had been interfactional fighting, but the outside threat of Caesar's troops meant very necessary cooperation. The Romans did not shy away from battle. Mobilizing all his forces, Caesar moved up towards the Thames on the following day to confront Cassivellaunus in his own territory. Whilst reverting to guerrilla tactics on the main body of Romans, Cassivellaunus persuaded his allies, the four kings of Kent, Singetorix, Carvilius, Taximagalus and Legovax to launch one last surprise attack on the Roman naval base. Inevitably, it ended in another bitter defeat for the Britons. He um, actually managed to penetrate much further inland, as far as the Thames, um, even though the Britons had a scorched earth policy and it, there would have been there were difficulties supplying his troops, but he managed to do this. He crossed the Thames, he defeated Cassivellaunus, who was the um, war leader of the Britons, the other tribes had and put themselves under his command and took Cassivellaunus's stronghold somewhere near St Albans in Hertfordshire. What it did mean 
was that Caesar became somebody who really needed to be stopped. The Roman Senate, the Roman establishment, was being threatened every 10 years or so by a big man like this, a big man coming back from a successful campaign who had to get land for his own troops, who provided a threat to the established state. Now, Caesar provided the, the next great threat. Cassivellaunus was forced to negotiate terms of surrender, Caesar demanding hostages and tributes to the Roman treasury. England was now certain to become another part of the Roman Empire. On the road to absolute control, there would be many rebellions and uprisings by both the conquered Britons and the Gauls. But with both the Britons and the Gallic tribes temporarily subdued, Caesar was able to embark on the final march to dictatorship in Rome. While Caesar had been in Gaul, there had been political turmoil in Rome. The political triangle had been reformed in 55 BC, and Pompey too had been given a great command, as had Crassus. But at the end of the 50s, the relationship began to fall apart. There was a personal reason for this. Pompey had been married to Caesar's daughter, a love match, but unfortunately, she died in childbirth uh, in 54 BC. The third member of the triangle, Crassus, who was campaigning in Parthia, got defeated and killed by the Parthians. And then there were two. Pompey wished to maintain his dominance of the Roman world. Caesar, it was said, wished no one to be superior to him. And so, as it came time for Caesar to come back from Gaul to Rome, the question was how he could be accommodated in the political field. As Cicero, a chronicler of the times, noted, the point at issue is this, and it is over this that men in power are going to fight. Pompey has made up his mind not to let Caesar be elected without his first surrendering army and provinces, while Caesar is convinced that his personal security depends on his keeping his army. So their old love affair and their detestable alliance have not decayed into furtive bickering, but have erupted into open war. And then Julia died, Caesar's daughter who was married to Pompey, who was a great sentimental link between them. And in the next year, Crassus died. And that meant there were just these two giants facing each other. I think Pompey actually did not want to break the alliance at that point. But there were many senators who absolutely detested Caesar for the way in which he'd forced that legislation through in his consulship in 59. And Pompey couldn't resist being made their champion, being pushed in the direction of eliminating Caesar, because he would therefore be, of course, the undisputed champion. So I think it was a combination of circumstances. And in the end, when the consuls of the year handed him the sword and said, defend the Republic, he just couldn't resist it. Well, I think even at this late stage, um, Caesar really didn't know quite what he was going to do. He was an opportunist. He had disbanded um, much of his army. He had some troops with him. And he was there he was on the, on the borders of his province, which was really uh, extended down to the north of Italy to the line of a little river here, just north of Rimini, uh, the Rubicon. That was the boundary of the province. If he crossed that river, he was acting illegally. Um, and he spent the night wondering whether he was actually going to do this, whether he would take the road from which there was no turning back. Um, in the end, he just said, you know, what the hell? And he went for it. And he crossed over, and they advanced on Rimini and took it, and, and the die was then, as Caesar said, the die was then cast. And of course, we still use the phrase to cross the Rubicon when you actually, there's no turning back. On the 10th of January, 49 BC, he crossed the Rubicon, a small river boundary between Italy and Cisalpine Gaul. He was well aware of the consequences of this rash action. In the end, when his attempts to obstruct, legitimately, it appears, the manoeuvres of his opponents failed. 
Caesar resorted to arms and crossed the Rubicon with his army. With characteristic speed, Caesar proceeded down through Italy towards Rome. Town after town was brought under his influence, causing Pompey to withdraw from Rome and move southwards, finally to leave Italy altogether. Well, the reaction to Caesar's invasion was really one of panic, it seems. Uh, they had never thought it would necessarily come to this. And civil wars were not that long ago. There had been civil wars 30-odd years ago. There had been a sort of civil war only 14 years ago. And there had been such constant disruptions in the Italian countryside. They knew what war really meant. Italy came under Caesar's control and Cicero saw his worst fears confirmed. His main anxiety was for the fate of the Republic, which he rightly observed was in mortal danger. To his friend Atticus he wrote, Absolute power is what both Pompey and Caesar have sought. Their aim has not been to secure the honor and happiness of the community. Pompey has not abandoned Rome because it was impossible to defend, nor Italy under forced compulsion. But it was his idea from the first to plunge the world into war, to stir up barbarous princes, to bring savage tribes into Italy under arms and to gather a huge army. But neither of them looks to our happiness. Both want to be kings. Disappointingly for Caesar, when he arrived back in Rome, his reception was lukewarm. The farewell speech he had prepared before leaving to seek out Pompey had to be abandoned. However, he wasted no time in pushing a law through the Senate investing himself with emergency dictatorship. This temporarily enabled him to appoint supporters as consuls for the next year in order to reinforce his position. It was now time to deal with the threat of Pompey. On the night of the 4th of January, 48 BC, a fleet set sail for Epirius, now Albanian territory, catching Pompey unawares. The Battle of Pharsalus, the largest ever fought between Romans, was about to begin. For Pompey, it was to prove a disaster. At Pharsalus, again, Pompey had the winning hand. Caesar was desperately trying to force on a battle. Pompey only really needed to delay. And Caesar was getting desperate. And then suddenly, Pompey agreed to fight. It's said that it was internal pressure in his own camp that brought the battle on. But it was the fighting of a battle in the first place that gave Caesar a chance, which he immediately seized. But it all went the wrong way. Pompey and the senatorial side really should have won. At the end of the battle, Caesar is reputed to have looked at the corpses littering the field and said, it was all their own doing. 15,000 of Pompey's men were dead, 24,000 taken prisoner, many fled. Another momentous chapter in Caesar's life was about to be written as he sailed across to Egypt in pursuit of the fleeing Pompey. What he could not know was that in order to appease the victorious, powerful dictator and prevent him from tarrying too long in their country, the Egyptians had already brutally assassinated Pompey. On his arrival, Caesar was presented with Pompey's signet ring and his severed head. It is said that he wept, but his dominance of the empire was now absolute. Egypt itself was in the throes of intense rivalry for the throne between the 15-year-old Ptolemy XIII and his sister, the 21-year-old Cleopatra. Caesar was 52 when he met Cleopatra and the arch womanizer was immediately captivated. To the distress of those attempting to place Ptolemy in sole charge of the Egyptian throne, Cleopatra was soon sharing Caesar's bed. The relationship between Rome and various kings in the Mediterranean was a long-standing 
obvious one. That is, these people could be very useful to Rome. They could control territories which were nominally in the Roman orbit. They could support Rome in her wars, and they didn't have to supply a garrison to defend them or administrators to run the province. So in some sense, Cleopatra fits absolutely into that pattern. He decided very early on to back her for the succession. She was an intelligent woman. He thought she could do the job. Um, and you can analyze the relationship strictly on that level. He wasn't in Egypt that long, of course. Uh, so it wasn't like Antony, where people begin to feel that he was absolutely ensnared. As soon as he thought he had to leave, he left. The question really is whether it was an amorous relationship and whether he fathered a child. And the ancient sources are divided on that. At the time, there was conflict about it. Antony claimed that Caesar had said it was his child. Other people said it wasn't. Some scholars think that since Caesar never managed to produce a son, in all those years when he dearly wanted one, and since he in fact only even produced a daughter in his years of his early marriage, that probably he wasn't capable of producing a child. Um, and I think we just don't know that. Um, but I think the relationship with her can be understood in very traditional way as trying to um, achieve a complete control over this very important part of the world through having an entirely loyal supporter. Egypt is very important for the corn supply and it's very important strategically. The affairs of Rome and its empire, however, pressed for urgent attention and Caesar was forced to visit Rome, where Mark Antony, ruling on Caesar's behalf, had mismanaged the state abysmally. By July 46 BC, he was back in Rome and had been re-elected dictator for the much longer period of 10 years. Yet he was not to live longer than another two. In this short period before his death, Caesar immersed himself in the affairs of state with all the vigor he normally invested in his military campaigns, although not necessarily with as much success. He acquired a vast amount of honors, some of which raised him to almost divine status, a procedure which was contrary to the principles of the Republic, which was scared of any form of tyranny and also to the basic egalitarianism within the Roman aristocracy who were in one sense all kings together. And finally having been dictator for limited periods he became dictator perpetuus which means without term. Now, the dictatorship is by definition an emergency office and is meant to be held for short term. So this is actually a contradiction in terms. What he meant by it isn't clear. Whether he really meant to be there forever or whether he really meant, I am going off to fight the Parthians and I do not want to have any arguments about when my power's finished. When I come home, we'll talk about it. He was made dictator for life. And um, there were those old-minded conservative Romans who believed passionately in the strength and the power and the dignity of the Republic. And here was this man who was setting himself up as a king. In 510 BC, the last of the kings, proud Tarquin, had been driven out of Rome. And here, 500 years later, they were getting a king back. And it was for that reason that Caesar ended up the victim of the assassin's knives. Caesar did manage to carry out fundamental and beneficial reforms and clearly felt that after all the unrest of civil war, Rome had to be led by one strong individual. But his contempt for the Republican system was becoming more apparent as he appeared dressed in symbols of kingship, even at public festivals. Exactly a month before he was killed, it was a festival of Lupercalia. It was one of Rome's oldest festivals. It was a fertility festival. To our minds, it's very strange. There were Roman noble, and running through the streets, naked or almost naked, uh, trying to hit the women that they passed with leather thongs to render them fertile. And Antony, Antony was consul, co-consul with Caesar. Antony was the second man in the Roman state, was running half naked or naked through the streets at this time. And he went up to Caesar. Caesar was sitting on a rostrum. Caesar wearing a very strange 
garb. It was a royal toga. It seems to have been a laurel wreath as well. Perhaps he was even sitting on a golden throne. There were a lot of symbols of kingship already there. But what Antony now offered him was a diadem. And the diadem is a very simple white band, white linen band, but it was a symbol of kingship from the East. And this would symbolize the kingship that was now being offered. Antony offered it, and Caesar rejected it, and the crowd applauded. And Antony offered it a second time. Caesar rejected it a second time, and the crowd applauded again. And finally, Caesar told them to take the band away. And what's going on there? It's very strange. Is Caesar tr hoping that the crowd will approve, hoping that he can take this symbol of kingship? Is he making a, a gesture of his refusal to take it? Or is it simply an attempt to gauge public opinion? It's very hard to know, but it was quite enough to make the Roman people, and the Roman senators in particular, very uneasy about what Caesar was really intending. In 44 BC, the pinnacle of his career had been achieved. He was voted dictator for life. Now that he was no longer a temporary dictator, the Senate felt forced to get rid of him. He had succeeded in shaking the foundations of Roman civilization, threatening the Republic, and the pretense that it was otherwise could no longer be continued. His opponents succeeded in uniting a group of at least 60 who desired for one reason or another to be rid of Caesar and agreed to his assassination. Among their number was Marcus Brutus, allegedly the illegitimate son of Caesar by his lover of 20 years, Servilia. The conspiracy to murder Caesar was really rather remarkable. It was led by Brutus and Cassius, but it involved more than 50 people. They had personal motives, some of them, without a doubt, jealousies and frustrations. But they were, in general, convinced that his dictatorship was providing a political society which was unacceptable. One sign of their devotion is the fact that they managed to keep it secret. No one knew of the conspiracy before it happened outside the conspirators. And without this, it could not have succeeded. We have pictures of the crowds clamouring around, pressing documents into his hand. We have pictures of the senators, too, crowding around him as he goes in. And finally, one of them, Casca, grabs the toga from Caesar's shoulder, and this was the signal for the assassination to begin. And Caesar says, Casca, what are you doing? And it's finally, so it's said, when he saw Brutus there among the assassins, that he sank to his feet and accepted his death. And he lay there, stabbed with 23 wounds. He lay there at the foot of Pompey's statue. Pompey's statue, which seemed to be presiding in an almost supernatural way over the death of his old adversary. The reason for doing it like that was that there was a tradition that Romulus, when he ceased to behave like a king and became a tyrant in the very early days of Rome, had been executed by the Senate. And I think there was a feeling that it should look like a corporate senatorial effort. Um, of course, it was particularly ironic that they were holding the Senate that day in the hall attached to Pompey's theater where there was a great statue of Pompey. Um, but I'm sure they felt it was important that a lot of them be involved in it so that they took a corporate responsibility. Brutus made the decision which he imposed on the others that no one else would be killed. This was to be simply a desperate attempt to get rid of a tyrant. No one else was to be branded with infamy by this action. Of course, it was disastrous because they left Antony, all his supporters, um, and these people very soon rallied and tried to get control of Rome. Caesar, the military genius, the divine dictator, was dead. Under his leadership, Rome had left its indelible mark on vast tracts of Europe. His passionate ambition Cruelty and compassion stirred fierce emotions of loyalty or loathing in those who knew him. To his men, he was their victorious general. To his enemies, a dangerous egoist. He has become immortalized in ancient history, the classics and by our greatest dramatists. Many great emperors have passed into legend and become part of the extraordinary story of ancient Rome. But it is the name of one man above all 
which has become synonymous with its glories and achievements, and which is remembered today. Gaius Julius Caesar. Well, I suppose everybody's heard about Julius Caesar. I mean, he's like Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Hitler. But even if they didn't know about him, we've got, we think about him every summer in a sense, because the month of July is just named after Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, July.